Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mike Leahy. Afternoon. I'm Mike Leahy. I'm the current steward of the Tactical Technology Office, and I get to be your closing act for today, and I'm up for that challenge. Let's see if you are. <laughs> TTO plays a unique role in the science and technology ecosystem. We depend on others for labs, test facilities, assets, subject matter experts, and growing our future PMs. We also don't have a monopoly on DARPA-worthy investment ideas. We do have a big checkbook and all the core supporting capabilities to turn big, hairy, audacious dreams into reality. I'm here today to stimulate your imagination, to motivate you to dream about what the future could look like and the outside role you could have in creating that future. I'm going to encourage you to think big, bet big, win big, to join in our mission to redefine possible. I took our mission statement and created this word cloud. And although it's somewhat specific to TTO, I'll Submit it could be used across the agency. At its core, we get the chance to redefine possible. Take a concept for a new game-changing military capability, convert it from PowerPoint to reality. We do the analysis to figure out what that is, the missing or immature technology. We're going to remove that limitation with a demo at credible scale in real-world environments. We're not limited by mission boundaries or cultures of any individual service, we get work across all four physical domains. I'll still leave the social ones for others. Air, space, maritime, ground, and frequently the seams between them. We don't create the effects. Other offices do that. But we deliver them to where they need to be to be effective. Our focus is on platforms, experimental platforms, X-planes, X-ships, et cetera. I sometimes joke to regard the right flank of the agency. We are a physical systems office. Demo platforms, system technologies, credible scale, realistic environments, real physical systems, high risk, high payoff bets. Let's take a quick look down memory lane to put our impacts into sharper focus. So I'm going to touch on a few wall-worthy past success stories. I want to do that to define the size and scope of the platform challenges which we take on. These are the kind of things you can get to do and come work with us. Because they are physical things, many of these are touchstones that DARPA is known for, and they came from this office. Stealth, everything unmanned, uncrewed, whatever term you want to use today. Space access, robotics. Let me pick a couple examples. One of those up there is dear to my heart, but others from everything from Have Blue on the stealth side to then doing Global Hawk, UCAV, sized vehicles, the whole system at scale. We redefined what that meant to be unmanned, and then we moved it all the way across. Then on the space side, Orbital Express, where we first did some of the things that we needed to do to be able to go up and demonstrate on orbit kind of capability that we're going to see brought to fruition with RSGS, Pegasus, Taurus, um, Falcon 1. Well, before Elon was Elon, he was getting money from us to be able to move down that what became Falcon 9. The active program, a case where the Navy had a memo put out that said, thou shalt not work with DARPA on this particular project, and now they've bought two of them. Right? That's a trait that we almost want in some ways to have because then it says to me, well, I'm damn sure I ought to be doing it because they're not. Um, Lorasm, so an example of where we took a case of something that wasn't necessarily a DARPA problem, but figured out how to move it quickly because the nation needed us to. All different sized things underwater. And then it was already mentioned on the robotics side and ground robots. I'd submit that if it's been done, it's been probably sponsored by this agency. Um, and the one on the bottom, I still think back to that um, Dark Mirror episode with that dog running around still scares me. Um, next slide, please. There is no overarching detailed plan on how we invest. We famously don't roadmap or follow rigid multi-year investment strategies. My strategy is this simple. Find inflection points and make big bets. Today we do that across these five different Ds that are kind of shown here as kind of a guide you know, almost by default, everything we do is some level of autonomy in it because it does, because of the things MTO and others have done. Uh, to, oh, I can disaggregate, disperse, diversify, be disruptive, and cast out. Now, when I say that, I'll talk about how I break all my programs into it, and then in true dark profession, I'll break my word in a minute by talking about something that violates all of those because there is no one particular model, and RSGS is the one that violates them. Right, big, expensive satellite uh, going up, uh, to be able to, or not satellite, but space vehicle, uh, to be able to demonstrate that we can do on-orbit servicing. We have answered the nation's call for a number of years on hypersonics. We continue to do that. We've got a couple of those programs. 
now in flight test today. So tactical boost glider, TBG, hypersonic air breathing concept, Hawk. There'll be a test later on acronyms. Um, we're exploring new ones to bring medium sized or 200 ton ships into the fight with no manning required ship or no Mars and sea train, just sea train. All right. And we're going to re envision Liberty ships for the 21st century. And I'll talk about much more as we go through here. One constant is we do not do science projects or stunts. We do our homework up front on defining an objective system. Prove to ourselves that if we could solve the tech challenges, it would matter. Somebody would care we could make discrimination on the battlefield. Outline what that OS concept looks like and what the elements DARPA needs to do to bring that to life. That's a demonstrator system. We put that in place about 20 years ago. We still continue to use it. Are the supporting pieces in place so that only one consecutive miracle away from building that DS. So that's my one consecutive miracle test. A particular example we're going to show here is for gremlins. So we looked at that idea of could we launch and recover tactically useful aircraft from another aircraft. Launch part, we'll all agree, is kind of pretty easy. So it came around to that, we, could we do the recovery? So yeah, there's a reason why we might be able to do that that's worth exploring. It's the recovery system. What about the recovery system? It's not the airplane we recovered in. Let's use a C-130. They're ubiquitous. You can get them. You would think you could get airworthiness certification on them easy, you'd be wrong. Um, and then we'd put a rack inside that was modular, and we're going to demonstrate that aspect of it. We did build a vehicle, but actually that vehicle was pretty stupid. It just had the lower brainstem activity and it required to be able to go do the demonstration. So we teased out what we needed to do. No smarts. We've done smarts in other programs. If we could make this successful, we know we'd be able to do that. That's kind of an example of how we walked through that, and we'll show some video uh, before on Gremlins later on. So before we dive, launch, or fly into driving into future platform possibilities, just a reminder, I get to do that without limitation to individual physical domains or their seams. And we'll talk seams more later. As a side note, all the different pictures you see up here are a great example of how sometimes we can take liberties with physics when we're doing concepts. Right? Because what the concept is there to do is to show you the idea and talk about it. A lot of the details of what we do are protected somewhere else. Within those domains, we're starting to spend some time in what I'll call rediscovered places and spaces. Because they're not, they've been there all along. We just didn't really go into them as much before. Asking ourselves how these rediscovered environments should influence our investments if they should. How do they change how we deter conflict and if called upon, fight and win? Climate change, as we all know, is opening up new transit possibilities in the Arctic. It still gets pretty cold up there. It's still a harsh environment. Cislunar is the new buzz phrase. Right, to describe the space beyond geo to just beyond the moon. And there's a whole bunch of interesting reasons why we get there. I always just like to put that in a little bit of context. If this is the Earth, the orbit around it, if I'm in LEO or low Earth orbit, you can't even see it. Geo is maybe this big. This auditorium is cislunar. And along with that, there's some very interesting three-body dynamics problems that exist out there that we have not taken advantage of before. So we need to figure out how we operate in that space even more before we figure out what it is we're going to put in that particular space. And that's the propulsion system called Draco, and that's different. Our most recent robotics challenge has dealt with the unique challenges faced by first responders uh, in the underground environment. Tim, I can't see you, but you're somewhere in the Iron Society before. This was sub T. If you have the opportunity, check out YouTube. It's some of the best produced videos you can find. What we're able to do with that. We overcame a whole bunch of challenges and new modes for perception, mapping, cross-domain teaming, but these problems are not solved. And for all the talk about darkening the sky with small sats, most of the world's comm traffic moves on fibers that run across the ocean floor, along with rich deposits of high value minerals, and that's a contested space. In all these cases, the commercial opportunities are every bit or more compelling than the pure military ones, and that's a win-win we're trying to be able to go after. All right, still with me? All right, with all that as a backdrop, where do we go from here? How do we boldly go where no platform has gone before? Or boldly revisit a concept or technology that some adjacent discovery gets into the one consecutive miracle rule, right? Since original sin, there's no new ideas. It's just sometimes things have caught up that make them doable when they weren't before. I'm going to take you on a journey where we stop on a baker's dozen excursions into possible futures. I'm going to hint at the endless opportunities out there and encourage you to spend some mental energy helping us redefine possible. Humans have felt the need for speed well before Maverick and Goose. Right? DARPA has always been on the leading edge of high speed. 
Over the past decade, our focus was on hypersonics, so faster than five times the speed of sound, weapons. Right? We were in the flight testing. You can see our way clear of that focus. It's a case where we needed to be able to hang tough, and we did, because these are complex and hard things to be able to do. And we're a projects agency, though. So while there's plenty of work remaining to mature that class of weapon, our role will end for the moment. So where do we go from there? We've explored hypersonic aircraft for decades in fits and starts and stops. There's excitement building around commercial applications and companies. And to hear Hollywood tell it, we already have the challenge solved. So I'm moving on. It's always going, but it's always going faster, the right answer. What if we slow down? Are there new propulsion concepts that enable us to affordably bridge the gap between subsonic and hypersonic weapons? For all we try, hypersonics are never going to be cheap. Are things like rotary detonation engines already ease? Are other promising technologies ready to make that leap from the lab to a credible demo? We're going to find out in our Gambit program. If you know anything about my background, you knew this one was coming. Right? UAS are now everywhere. Hell, I can buy a damn capable one from Costco for a couple hundred bucks. So what is the DARPA play? Good question. As much as we are and should leverage commercial developments from small systems to visions of electric air taxis, there remains unique military requirements, at least ones that the military puts more priority on. So you see up the concept there. We just released a video that kind of highlights that a little further, trying to look at how we do small, no kind of touch kind of systems. It's an artist concept. It's deliberately not meant to be what will probably be fielded, although we get extra credit maybe if you do. More clever ways than just adding rotors to existing fixed wing, right? I can go to any conference, add rotors, fixed wing, fine. I don't want to carry that scar tissue around. Can I avoid the infrastructure associated with launch and recovery, maintain range, endurance, and high payload fraction? We're going to go find out. We've got an industry day, or a proposer's day. Actually, it's a presenter's day. Happening next Tuesday, we're not only with industry people coming in, but also bringing in a large collection of commercial vendors with all different pieces and parts we might be able to use to solve this. But again, it doesn't already exist. This is a quest unblemished by success in recent TTO history. Right? We have been willing to fail in this business. We're going to go at it again because it's an enduring problem. We learn from our lessons and go forward. And that's a key thing to mention across the board. Right? One of the hallmarks of what we do is not being a fail to fail, learn from that, and regroup. Sometimes it's a different size, different class, different way of being able to do it. But if the problem is still there, we'll figure out a way to go attack it again. Shifting gears a little bit, to the right is another concept for the hopeless diamond, the high end of the UAS market. Can we reimagine a predator reaper for the high end fight? Do advances in electric power, non-kinetic weapons, modern manufacturing of materials, active flow control, keep going, keep going, keep going, but no, not you. Put us at the foot of the next big step forward, or, as the best we can do, continue to evolve. And therefore, DARPA should focus elsewhere until we're at an inflection point. I don't know. We'll find out. Speaking of holy grails, what about the combining the need for speed with no good place to land or take off? Thinking beyond just UAS class systems to ones that could replace an MV-22, carry the same cargo quicker, and with higher survivability. Do we need to hover or just get in and out of a soccer field? How far, how fast, how big, how affordable? Is there a family of systems or just a group of point designs? Again, we're just one tech miracle away. And if we are, then what is even the crazy idea beyond that one? Going up a little higher in altitude, I promise I would spell this out. So that's peripherated low Earth orbit, or paleo constellations. I'm showing the iconic white and green graphic from our blackjack program. This is one of your systems of signs of success here. You come up with something that's iconically shown. Every time somebody talks about Pilu in the press, it's that image. All right, that's your wall-worthy piece of that. All right, here we envision a near-term future, a large constellation of affordable space vehicles with teraflops of onboard processing and multiple optical data links within and between the constellations. And we're leveraging commercial extensively for that, not just in the comms, but in the lines that we're going to do it. It's not just taking a commercial satellite, but taking a commercial line, figuring out what's different and unique and we have to do. We'll already claim one big transition success with the birth of the Space Defense Development Agency. That's from phase one. Showed a real solution was possible. The first objective of Blackjack was to convincingly demonstrate 
that the progress being made in the civilian sector could be affordably applied to military applications. That took a full systems program. Bus, payloads, brains, and integration. It was a classic TTO project. It was also cla unclassic in a way that you would never build a system the way we did. Right? You come up with requirements, you'd go to an integrator, and say, stitch this together. We did the reverse. We said, can I get a bus that works and I can afford? Can I put payloads on there that aren't just bricks for the cost point I want? Then can I put the smarts on it? Then I'll throw it over to the integrator and try to make it all come together. I wouldn't advise you to go do that if you're building real satellites, but that was exactly the right way to approach this particular problem. And we have, and we're now moving forward, being able to put that in place. And like anything, it's going to cost more. It's going to be a little more capable. But again, when you set goals and prices for them, it doesn't make a sense. Find where the needs in the curve are. That's what we're trying to do with that project. Our focus was on the power of a constellation. Right? We know we can build the individual components. And we knew we would fall short of demonstrating the full potential. So we stood up the oversight program you know, to close that gap in constellation autonomy. But with SDA stood up and on track to deploy their tranche zero and contracts in place for tranche one, commercial industries on a sharp upward vector, is there a role for TTO in this space or DARPA going forward? Should we be watching or investing in seedlings for the next inflection point, or is it time to leave this orbital domain and focus elsewhere? I could have titled this next topic, Next Generation Space Vehicles, but I already know that requires a new generation of space propulsion so I'm just going to skip that step and go from there. The first image is from our Draco project, our current big bold bet on nuclear thermal propulsion, or NTP. NTP is not a new concept. It's been around since before safety was invented in the late 60s, and we could do extensive ground testing in places like Jackass Flats, Nevada. Can't do that anymore, damn it. All right. What is new is 30 years of advances in nuclear and material science and new national space policy on HALU. That's your acronym for the day. Repeat after me. High assay, low enriched uranium. Right? And need to conduct missions in a new piece of space. Right? The enemy's getting a vote. They're out there. We're going to do it. Prime example of how in many cases, multiple vectors need to converge to motivate that big bet. It wasn't just one kind of thing. We are betting that working with NASA, because it's civilian applications exist in the same space. It's a perfect example how to link some of those things together. Uh, we're trying to work through that. We can conduct an in-space demo by FY26. Yep, I said that right, FY26. Right? We are trying to kick the door open. Right? We will not be in this space forever, but we want to plant a flag and go prove we can do something. It's an aggressive goal to be able to make that happen. It will not be the thing. It will demonstrate what we need for the thing. That space vehicle is really a flying test stand for that reactor. Right? We can't light it up until we get into a place in orbit where we aren't coming home again. Right now, the thinking is once we've jump-started that, our role here is done for the moment. Can you prove me wrong? In 2024, the partnership of Space Logistics LLC and DARPA will launch a space vehicle with the world's most sophisticated and most expensive robot payload. All right, what will be showing up here is elements of a scenario to be able to go plug in fuel all right, into another satellite. All right, little basic kind of screen math here for us, that if you're a geo bird doing comms, you have to have enough fuel on board to be, get to the graveyard orbit when you're done. That's about a year's worth of maneuvering in a normal day. A normal maneuvering for a year has a revenue of $50 million. You can do the rest of the math. So if I can get up there and put more fuel on board and give you five more years and I can save that amount of money, there's a business case there and somebody's pursuing it. And that's what we want. The bet here is we can jumpstart a vehicle or a viable on-orbit refueling and servicing commercial enterprise. Because I don't want to own it. I want this as a service. I want to call the Maytag repairman and say, go fix my satellite. Right? We also know of cases where there's billion dollars pieces of space junk that are now up there because one pound of force put in the right place would have unfolded the solar sails and panels and got us what we needed to be able to do. So from the beginning, we pursued a commercial solution. We want to buy this as a service, not to own and operate a fleet of servicers, Took two tries, first one didn't quite work, but confident we'll see the next one. System was designed to operate in a harsh geo environment for almost a decade. Like many first of a kind systems, it's an exquisite solution. We want to explore a wide range of options, break the evolutionary path industry would normally have followed down, which means it's very expensive. Have to cut that cost and complexity of operations by an order of magnitude. That's not really something we're gonna play directly in. NASA and the commercial players are looking at assembly and manufacturing low orbits, Plot them, it's a lot cheaper to operate in that space. Some good momentum already in place. 
So have we realized the vision we launched at Orbital Express all those years ago? And earn the right to kick back, drink a cold one, and watch how this plays out for a while. Is there a tougher environment, operating environment, than Geo for Robotics? I'm not looking to settle that argument here, but my deep underwater colleagues can probably make that case. As in space, a wide range of commercial and military applications, oil and gas industry gives us some great use cases to cut our teeth on. Going a big step beyond on orbit by completely cutting the cord back to the human operator. I want systems that swim in from a distance, perceive and manipulate objects with minimal a priori information in highly turbid murky waters. Basically can't see my hand in front of my face. All without direct human intervention. Once I solve that one, then I'm good. Right? So we started that program by doing that first. We wouldn't allow you to go make the fancy vehicle we all love to do. Prove what existing ones you can do to perception and other pieces. As with space, we're hoping our lead investments will encourage commercial investment they have, and one of our vendors in this, and a continued growth of an industry where, again, we can buy services instead of systems. So what's the next step? A jump in capability, greater dexterity, better sensors, perception, affordability. What will you propose when you get your chance as a DARPA PM? To complete the robotic trifecta, we go back to the land. No, not the old Disney Epcot rides. We have built and crashed a fleet of different robotic ground vehicles over the years. I show one of them behind me. Right? Runs over big ditches, can do almost 65 miles an hour in flat terrain, but do you see it on the battlefield? No. Triumphs in mechanical engineering, but failures at the mission level. This is a case where the platform needs to take a back seat to the brains. It's guts and skin argument. To redefine the possible here, we needed to redefine our approach. So we created an autonomy-focused project. We provide the physical kit. That's what that example is sitting over inside. It's one of the dune buggies. Best, got the best sensors on there, best compute. I give it to all performers. I give them multiple ones. I've already hard broke a couple of them. Right? They're out at the Camp Roberts as we speak, getting ready for the next uh, demonstration. If you can demonstrate with that vehicle that you can solve the particular problem I want and get out in front and stay there, Right, then we'll give you the opportunity to get into that 10 ton vehicle before. I want performers to drive these surrogates like a rental. Right? Success is a road littered with broken down vehicles so we can feel robotic combat vehicles that don't need remote operators. If they're only a couple clicks back, they're just the target a little farther back. I need robots that can be out in front and provide true game changing scout mission capability. There's also a prime example of a tranche two project. Let me explain what I mean by that. The fact that we could do robot combat vehicles, there's now acquisition programs that the Army has stood up, and we're going to do those. And the beauty of that now is we don't need to convince them. That was tranche one. So when they put their money on the line to be able to go do this, it's not at risk if we fail. Right? So we can take that opportunity. But what we're trying to do is take really tranche three and bring it all the way forward. I have a PM on this project whose stated goal in life is to move forward by a generation what was to, could be done otherwise, right? Got him from ARL, he has a background, Stuart Young, he knows all these different players and people. What he needed was, had the motivation, had the motor, needed the resources we could provide, we're giving him those, we're gonna make see how this happens. Is the future frontier in this more the combination of platforms operating in teams across different domains, airspace and ground? Is that the key to fully re realized vision for Robot Scout? I don't know. How do we go about changing the world? And is another aspect of being able to do that. I know it's blasphemous, but let's talk less about platforms and more about different ways to deploy and employ them. Here's the video from the successful attempt uh, to be able to bring uh, gremlins home uh, from flying without having to use the ground as the catcher uh, for being able to do that. Um, this was a perfect case where we demonstrated the capability we wanted to do. We did the proof of principle, but it's short of the goal we wanted. Our audacious goal here was to do four vehicles in 30 minutes. We got one vehicle. All right. And it took us longer than we thought, of course, uh, to be able to go make that happen. Um, but what we wanted, what was important here is that we got to that point, we stayed with it as long, but then we got out of it. Right? We got to the point where we could prove it would work, and then we left it for other people to be able to take that and go forward. Next one, please. Oh, there was one I just wanted to make point of that before I move that chart too, although I'm not showing it. You know, it's also, also multiple domain kind of things. Um, we've looked at launching from other vehicles and we talk about different deployment mechanisms. What about something that is equally at home on the air and underwater? 
What about if I could get there part of the way and then instead of flying over the fences, swim underneath them? What other crazy multi-domain concepts are there out there? Beyond out-of-the-box deployment concepts, what about novel formations? The main graphic here is from our C-Train program. So one of the things we wanted to be able to do is create smaller and cheaper vehicles, right, to disaggregate them. Well, those smaller vehicles are not very efficient at transiting to different locations. And if somebody has to carry them to the fight, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. But what we figured out is that we could almost put them butt to tail behind each other, and then we get the long, slender hull from multiple vehicles that we'd get from one large destroyer. And the goal here was to form up outside of San Diego, go across the Denier Island chain, perform missions for you know, a couple months or so, and then come home on a tank of gas. And we think that's actually doable. Right, what we've seen in the tunnel, uh, the water tunnels for this, we think we can improve that transit range by over 30%. Retain the advantage of distributed maritime ops without the transit penalty or having to dedicate scarce ships for that purpose. We're doing a mechanical version of this. We're doing a ducking version of it as well. Now, nobody will believe that until we do about a one-third scale demo in the open water, but with that kind of promise, it's certainly worth taking a shot. Then what about the other graphic? If I could tow a series of platforms underwater behind a surface ship, hit you right across the Pacific, get dropped off at the desired location, and I was exposing myself along the way. Not as simple as just holding on to a rope behind a car, but our studies didn't show any showstoppers. Same thing, connecting those vehicles together makes a very nasty multi-domain optimization problem or control problem to solve it. What are the unique and novel types of formations providing outsized utility? Almost forgot. Cannot leave the stage without exploring the alternatives for next generation of surface and underwater platforms. The video illustrates a concept of an underwater platform autonomously navigating while carrying a payload of military significance, staying underwater for an extended period of time because it can generate its own electricity. That's the key, right? An underwater vehicle, it's only underwater for a month at a time and again has to be deployed, kind of defeats the purpose. On this particular case, uh, this is launching a small kite. It's surprising, but minimal currents, you can generate up to a kilowatt of electricity. That's a lot of electricity for that kind of application. You can station keep for a while, because what we found is you can't camp at the bottom. If you stay there, they will eventually find you. You don't have to be moving all the time, but you have to be relocatable, and you have to have a payload that matters. If you think of taking that same power piece, maybe you tie that to something on the ground, now you have a power station that other people come up and refuel at. We're converting that cartoon into a reality. We're exploring a way to harvest energy from small differences in water currents and differences in temperature. What else is there out there? On the right is the CAD view of our latest unmanned medium surface vessel. It's the first ship since the advent of sail, designed from the keel up to never have humans on board. Because once you let a human on board, then it has to be human rated, defeats the purpose. Like the manta ray, this tough little ship is designed to stay underway for extended periods of time with up to 100 tons of payload. Look at that flat deck, use your imagination. It's going to autonomously refuel at sea and only come ashore for depot level maintenance. And what we're going to do is we're going to pop the hoods in the top, we're going to yank the pieces out, we're going to put new ones in, we're going to be out flying again or driving again in the water. If you could buy one of these for under 30 million, Think of all the trade space that opens up to reimagine what constitutes a surface action group. That ship is second generation autonomy. So the first generation was active, now called Sea Hunter, where it removed the executive functions but left the rest of the crew. With all the crew now gone, what is the third generation disruption? Final new platform mind bender I want to leave you is seams. Seams between domains, doctrines, cultures, some of the biggest innovative disruptions live in those seams where others cannot visualize or mentally bridge the gaps. Our most recent big example here is Liberty Lifter. And that's in dying to convey, and we use that term to give you liberty ship for the 21st century. What was that? It was an inexpensive thing that could be mass produced to move large volumes. We now need that for the 21st century, especially out in the Pacific. A big boat that lives on the water, but operates more efficiently in ground effect, but can fly to 10,000 feet if it needs to. Again, an artist concept. We have videos out there for that. We've got people we're putting on contract to be able to do this. Capable of forming a, a range of traditional Marine, Navy, and Air Force missions, yet not something any individual service would invest in. The other key part about this is, sure, I know I can build this thing. Can I build it at a price point that is one-third per pound, because we still buy stuff by the pound, of what it takes me for a C-17? And we have done demonstrations. This one took us a while. We spent a couple years on ceilings to make sure 
that we could convince ourselves that it was feasible to use boat building techniques for an airplane. And the smart people who have bid on this have combined airplane and boat people to get it back. I need to get the Navy interested, so the Air Force will try to steal it back. Right. But again, this is just one example what other ones are out there that enable a new class of systems or a whole new approach to delivering effects on the battlefield. What seams can we exploit together? The point of this briefing was not to prove I could entertain you for 35 minutes or so. However, something I said, hopefully, something I said triggered your imagination or made you realize there was maybe a government agency who was maybe just crazy enough to make your dream a reality. Like all the other tech offices, we have an office-wide BAA announcement to which you can submit white papers and proposals. But before you go to that trouble, strongly encourage you to scan our list of PMs on that same website. Search out a PM who might be the most receptive to your idea. Coming in cold doesn't help. We, of course, post any RFIs, BAAs. We have appropriate government sites. We do industry days. Along with PM and project histories, our public website has a range of resources about how you can work with us. One final note. As you may have become evident to some of you in the audience, I was being very careful with my scenarios and examples. That's why I got my teleprompter working here. Keep me sane. While there are a wide range of future platforms we can talk about openly, we get into performance specifications, we need to protect that level of information properly. We also have the means to do fully informed projects and germinate special concepts and special spaces. So if you're security people, call my security people. This guided tour of the future is po possible is over. But hopefully, you can continue to dream big and maybe one day join us to bet big and win big. With that, I'll now be happy to take any questions. All right, first one up. Does an idea have to have a direct military application for DARPA to consider it? it ha I would answer that with a subtle answer that it has to have a national security application for DARPA to consider it. Right? We don't do purely commercial kind of research or work uh, for what that would be. A lot of our stuff in the best worlds has um, commercial applications. And for example, on Liberty Lifter, I'm, I've got visions of that being out in the craft fleet someday. And if FedEx and I was going to use that for the same purposes, we might want to be able to use it for but it starts with something that uniquely helps in this issue and related to national security. All right, I have an idea for a project that DARPA might want to consider. What's the best way to pitch that idea? Somebody walk up to me today. Um, as I alluded to, probably the best way there is to um, seek out a PM who has a similar kind of range of interests, um, be able to kind of offer it up. We have the ability to do um, seedling kind of investments in specific case of TTO, almost all of our projects, we do some work in front of it, right? As much as I would want to believe I could just stroll up with a handful of papers and ask for a couple hundred million dollars for my boss, they still want us to be able to have some idea that we could actually succeed and we go off and do things, right? And we want to be able to make sure that what we do has a reasonable chance to be successful, right? That there's a reference design that closes, not a solution that necessarily gives, uh, bounds you by what you're doing. Any concept you, art you see from us is exactly that. It's not meant to direct you toward how you're going to be able to solve the problem, but it is to envision what a solution may look like, knowing that we are probably closed up on being able to do that. So work with them. We have the ceilings we can do. We have SBRs, STTRs, and an office-wide uh, BAA application for that. And that's also a good way, if you're thinking about being a PM, to come in and talk to some of the folks who have done that before, get a sense from them on some of the things they may be thinking about that they're going to have to let go to somebody else. Because right? very rarely do you get to see your program all the way through. So you have to put your baby up for adoption, and you want to find good adoptive parents so they don't screw it up on you uh, when you leave. Okay, So they're motivated to be able to do that. Final question, what skills, experience, and qualities does, do we look for in a potential program manager? Um, so a couple things. Uh, one is we're doing complex system projects. So in our particular case, we are looking for mid-career people. This cannot be somebody's first rodeo. But I want somebody who's got experience uh, working those kind of projects. If it's classified, it's good to have experience in that world as well, because as you know, that's a trust game. You want to have established those trusts and those contacts. And then you've got to be able to be passionate about what you want to be able to do. You've got to know the technology that you want to be able to do it with. Um, you've got to be driven to get that answer, and then you've got to be able to listen. Right? You will not be, as shocking as it is to hear, 
the smartest person in the room all the time. It will be your project. It will be your vision. You're going to be the drive behind it. But we're going to surround you with a group of people who have a lot of experience. And you're going to want to listen to them and be able to determine how best they can help you do some of the routine and mundane things, even at DARPA, you got to be able to do to be able to make your project successful and get it out in the world and be able to make that happen. So those kind of things. Somebody who's driven, right? Here's an example of Stuart before, been in that world for a long time, just motivated, wanted to go do something, right? It's not just four years of your life. It's a special journey. It's a special time. I'm going to have rare pearls that we hand out. Why should you be the one to do it? Come convince us that it's there. As everybody has said from the stage before, this is a program or PM-centric organization. The PMs are the rock stars. The offices enable the PMs. The front office enables the offices. Right, but I will famously joke that no rock star puts on a concert without roadies. All right? And so you want to have a good group for doing that. And there's a big distinction between divas and rock stars. I don't need the second part of that. Um, so if you got that kind of skill, if you think that, talk to one of the PMs who's been there and successfully done it. We've got a big alumni community you can talk to as well. Or just uh, reach out, and we'll be happy to talk with you. With that, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions you may have afterwards. Thank you.